After finishing the first module, which is all about creative writing and its elements, we now go to one of the factors that make creative writing, imagery. The objectives of this lesson are for you to determine imagery used, construct a paragraph applying imagery, and apply essence of imagery in writing creative compositions. Content of the day, what is imagery? Types of imagery, examples of imagery, significance of imagery, why writers use imagery, and diction. So, what is imagery? Imagery is a literary device that uses descriptive language that functions as a way for readers to better imagine the world of the piece of literature. Using imagery helps the readers to better understand the imaginary world that authors create. Imagery associates with mental pictures. Most of the time, it is described as painting a picture with words. It aids readers to visualize authors' writings better. Imagery involves all five of our senses, hence making it feel as though readers are experiencing the story themselves. One of the reasons why most people find reading boring is probably because of the lack of creativity in which the story is told. These people may find it hard to imagine what is happening in the story if it doesn't have much description of the events. This is why imagery holds a very important place when writing. Imagery sparks imagination of the readers and paints a vivid image in their minds. Reading a book feels like we're being transported to other places, other times. We may feel like we're taking a stroll in Paris, near the Eiffel Tower, enjoying in a pub in London, snorkeling in Palawan, or just enjoying the sunset. But it's so much more than a picture in our mind or an imaginary sound. Visual and auditory imagery are just two of the five norms of imagery. What are the five types of imagery in literature? We have visual, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and auditory. Get ready to take your senses for a ride through each one of these five forms of imagery. Let's discuss one by one. Visual. This is the most common form of imagery in literature. Visual imagery has something to do with our eyes, what we see through our sense of sight. Every part of story are vivid imageries of the characters and setting, making visual imagery not only common, but abundant. Abundant means there are plenty or many visual imagery in stories. For example, Catherine had shiny black hair that glimmers when under the sun. Is the author describing the character's appearance through visual imagery? If the author writes, the leaves of the trees flutter with the morning wind. We are enjoying visual imagery as the author sets the scene because the person talking sees the swaying of the leaves in the trees. Visual images are very important because it creates images in the reader's mind, giving them a clear view of what is happening in the story. It is like the words used are walking you through the book or poem you are reading. With that, you are able to experience the story through words. What's your favorite scene? What is something you like looking at? If you give a description of that, you are already using visual imagery. If visual is about our sight, olfactory is connected with the nose or sense of smell. For example, she smelled the scent of the sweet hibiscus wafting through the air. Its tropical smell a reminder that she was on vacation in a beautiful place. Not only does this sentence describe what the character was smelling at the time, it also gives us a glimpse of the setting of the story. It tells us that the person was not in her hometown, but somewhere else or on a vacation. Science has proven our sense of smell is our strongest link to the past. A single whiff of your father's favorite coffee can take you back in time. Authors would like to tap on something like that. 
connecting you with the past or present experiences of the characters. So, when the main character of a novel walks into his mother's kitchen and catches the garlic, peppery, and salty smell of adobo cooking, it immediately takes you back to when your lola cooks you lunch whenever your parents are not around to cook it themselves. A single description of that perfume you have always loved because it reminded you of someone you used to love makes you travel time. That feeling when you smell something that reminds you of a loved one you lost truly links you to the past. There are also people who like the smell of petrol or petrichor. If you have given a description of it, you are using olfactory imagery. This type of imagery also helps you be familiar to what the character in a story is experiencing. It gives us more detail of what surrounds the characters. Gustatory imagery has to do with our taste buds. After you stop sniffing that adobo, you're going to want to eat it, paired with rice. It's all about your sense of taste. For example, the candy melted in her mouth and the swirls of bittersweet chocolate and slightly sweet but salty caramel blended together on her tongue. The author not only tells us what the person was eating, but also describes how it tastes like so readers actually know as if they were tasting it themselves. All in your imagination, of course. Try remembering your favorite food and describe how it tastes like. That is using gustatory imagery. Tactile imagery reaches out to our sense of touch. Have you ever gone to the mall or divisoria to buy clothes, bed sheets, or mats? Do you feel the clothes before deciding to buy them? Is it soft, rough, smooth? Have you ever had to stay in a cold room and the coldness starts to get to your skin and it leaves a prickly sensation? Have you ever had goosebumps? Any phenomenon related to your sense of touch is tactile imagery. For example, after the long run, he collapsed in the grass with tired and burning muscles. The grass tickled with his skin and sweat cooled on his brow. Anyone probably had felt grass on their skin and sweat trickling down their face. Because we are already familiar with this sensation, the author describing this makes it feel as if readers are the ones who are experiencing this. It gives us what a character is feeling or experiencing in the story. Finally, auditory imagery appeals to our sense of hearing. It is when you hear the honking of the cars in the streets that indicates that the road must be busy. When your dog barks in the middle of the night, that means there are intruders in your vicinity. When you hear the melody of your favorite song and it reminds you why you love that song so much, or when you hear the waves of the sea, the tweets of the birds, the sound of laughter by the seashore. For example, silence was broken by the peal of piano keys as Shannon began practicing her concerto. The sound of piano is an auditory image. Also, note that silence is also considered as auditory. There may not actually be sound produced when there is silence, but considering that you also use your hearing to know that it's actually quiet, it is considered auditory. Other examples include, it was dark and dim in the forest. The words dark and dim are visual images. The children were screaming and shouting in the fields. Screaming and shouting appeal to our sense of hearing or auditory sense. He whiffed the aroma of brewed coffee. Whiff and aroma evoke our sense of smell or olfactory sense. The girl ran her hands on a soft satin fabric. The idea of soft in this example appeals to our sense of touch or tactile. The fresh and juicy orange is very cold and sweet. Juicy and sweet, when associated with oranges, have an effect on our sense of taste or gustatory. Romeo and Juliet Act 1, Scene 5 Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night, like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. 
Romeo praises Juliet by saying that she appears more radiant than the brightly lit torches in the hall. He says that at night her face glows like a bright jewel shining against the dark skin of an African. Through the contrasting images of light and dark, the use of visual imagery, Romeo portrays Juliet's beauty. To Autumn, John Keats Or singing as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hillborn, hedge crickets sing. And now we travel soft to redbreast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. The animal sounds in the excerpt keep appealing to our sense of hearing. We hear the lamb bleating and the crickets chirping. We hear the whistles of the red-breast robin and the twitters of swallows in the skies. Keats called these sounds the song of autumn. What again is the imagery concerning sounds? Right, the example used auditory imagery. Once more to the lake. When the others went swimming, my son said he was going in too. He pulled his dripping trunks from the line where they had hung all through the shower and wrung them out. Languidly and with no thought of going in, I watched him. His hard little body, skinny and bare, saw him wince slightly as he pulled up around his vitals the small, soggy, icy garment, and he buckled the swollen belt. Suddenly, my groin felt the chill of death. The images depicting the dampness of clothes convey a sense of the chilly sensation that we get from wet clothes. When you get chilly and feel dampness of clothes, these are tactile imagery. Great Expectations It was a rimy morning and very damp. I had seen the damp lying on the outside of my little window. Now, I saw the damp lying on the bare hedges and spare grass. On every rail and gate, wet lay clammy, and the marsh mist was so thick that the wooden finger on the post directing people to our village, a direction which they never accepted for they never came there, was invisible to me until I was quite close under it. The repeated use of the words damp and wet makes us feel how miserable it was for him that damp and cold morning. The thick marsh mist aids our imagination to visualize the scene of morning in a marsh land. The example uses tactile imagery as describing the damp and cold morning. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Brookfield he had liked, almost from the beginning. He remembered that day of his preliminary interview, sunny June, with the air full of flower scents and the plick plock of cricket on the pitch. Brookfield was playing Barnhurst, and one of the Barnhurst boys, a chubby little fellow, paint a brilliant century. Queer that a thing like that should stay in the memory so clearly. This is an excellent example of the use of imagery in Goodbye Mr. Chips. First, the word sunny refers to the visual imagery. The flower scent refers to the sense of smell. And then the plick plock refers to the sense of hearing. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud that flows on high o'er vales and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. This is a very good example of imagery. The poet uses the sense of sight to create a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, and their fluttering and dancing also refers to sense of sight. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep but I have promises to keep. Robert Frost uses visual imagery in these lines of his famous poem, As the Woods Are Lovely, Dark, and Deep. My November Guest My sorrow, when she's here with me, thinks these dark days of autumn rain are beautiful as days can be. She loves the bear, the withered tree. She walked the sudden pasture lane. This poem by Robert Frost is yet another good example of imagery. In the second line, the poet uses dark days, which is an instance of the use of visual imagery. In the fourth line, the bare, withered tree uses the imagery of sight. In the fifth line, the sodden pasture is also an instance of tactile imagery. 
After looking at all these examples, you must have already understood what imagery is. Now, what is the function of imagery? Why is it significant? The main purpose of imagery is to give vibrant and graphic presentation of scenes in a story that appeals to as many of the reader's senses as possible. Sometimes, when someone reads, they tend to put themselves in the shoes of the characters to get a full experience of the story. So, using the senses known to a person, namely the sense of sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, it is as if the readers are experiencing it themselves. Next, it helps the reader's imagination to clearly visualize, imagine, or envision the characters and scenes in the piece they are reading. By using a very detailed description of the scenes through imagery, readers are able to better visualize what is happening in the story. Images can also use figures of speech, that can further beautify the piece of literature. An author uses imagery to help readers understand the fictional world. Imagery is essential to nearly every form of writing, and writers use imagery for a wide variety of reasons. It engages readers. Using imagery helps readers better understand a piece of literature, and when they understand it, the better engaged they are. Sparks the reader's imagination. Since words are only used in writing language, it is up to the readers to imagine what they are reading. Using imagery and its detailed description helps readers imagine the scenes happening in the story. It makes the story interesting. Because of detailed description, readers can better imagine the story and makes it more interesting. It sets the scene and helps understand characters better. Like in the examples given earlier, just by using imagery, it already helps readers to know where the characters are in or in what kind of scene they are in, and describing the characters using imagery helps readers understand characters better. Who needs a movie to take a sensory ride? All you need to do is crack open a book, and it's already a portal to an unknown world. Before you know it, all five of your senses are taking a ride down the imagination highway. Don't let the journey end at the end of a chapter. Allow poetry to do the same with your imagination. Create a movie of your own in your own mind. Read and explore through your senses. After imagery, let us now move on to the next topic which is diction. What is diction? Diction is a style of speaking or writing that is dependent upon word choice. Good diction refers to good choice of words used in expressing ideas. It also involves how words were arranged, its appropriateness, effectiveness, accuracy, and distinction with which they were used. The choice of words should be understood by readers and listeners easily. It also includes how words were enunciated. We will be discussing six types of diction, namely formal, informal, colloquial, slang, pedantic, and poetic. Let's discuss them one by one. First, we have formal diction. Formal diction uses polite and proper words. Formal language is often filled with descriptive words that are quite precise and sentences may be longer. It is often used in formal situations such as press conference and presentations. For example, Hello young man, it is a true pleasure to make your acquaintance. How are you feeling today? Just by reading this, you already have a sense that the people talking have just met and under very formal situations because of the choice of word of the speaker. Just imagine you are trying to send an email to your professor or teacher. You will not use words that you normally use with your friends. You use words that are polite and proper, just like in the example. But in informal diction, these are words used in talking with your friends. You assume that the audience already knows what you're talking about and generally uses short words. Sentences may be incomplete or ignore some finer points of grammar and usage. 
Like in the example, Hey kid, nice to meet ya. What's up? Take note of the word ya instead of you and the question what's up instead of how are you. It used in formal diction. Unlike formal diction that is most of the time used in formal situations, informal diction is used when you're with friends at school, at the house of friends of your mom. There is less tension under those circumstances, making the feeling lighter and there is no need for such formal words. Let's see an example of both formal and informal diction to compare the two. For formal diction, we have the example, The man spoke to his father in a low voice so others could not hear. It used more polite words and just by reading it, you can already sense the formality of it. Informal That guy told his dad secrets on the down low. Down low means discreet or in a careful manner not to be noticed. Just look at how different the words used in the two types of dictions. Formal used man instead of guy. Father was used informal, while dad was used in informal. Down low for informal and low voice for formal. Also, notice that the example for formal diction is longer than the informal because formal diction tends to use longer sentences because of the use of polite and more proper words. Another example, imagine you were invited to a gathering or party by your boss, but you decided to leave the party early. Your boss may say, Would you care to explain the reason behind your decision to leave the gathering early? There is a sense of authority and formality in the question. And of course, you have to respond formally because you were asked in such a way. You may say, I'm sorry, ma'am or sir. There was an unexpected family emergency and I was needed at home. I had to rush and was not able to ask for your permission. Please forgive me, it will not happen again. But if it's just your friend who asks you, they may say, Why'd you leave the party so soon? And you may just answer by saying, Sorry, there was a problem at home and I had to leave. Notice the difference? In the Philippines, there are more than 150 languages and dialects. Dialects are the variation of these languages depending on the location or region. For example, we have the word pintas. In Manila, when you make pintas, you point out something wrong or see fault in someone. In Ilocano, it actually means beauty or someone is beautiful. The word umay in Tagalog is nagsawa na or in English, you're already sick or tired of something. But in Ilocano, it means to go. Bigat in Manila means the weight or heaviness of something, but in Ilocano, it actually means morning. Urong in Manila means to move backwards, but in Bulacan, it means to wash dishes. These words vary from different regions and communities. In the Philippines, there are actually a lot of examples of colloquial dictions. These are just some of the examples. Next, slang diction. Slang can be a new word, a shortened or modified word, or words that take on a new meaning. Some contemporary slang words are Bay as a term of endearment and it is a newly coined term. There is also basic which means something or someone is very common or a conformist which was modified and given new meaning. For example, those women are so basic. They only like the new movie because everyone else did. Another is to show receipt which means to show proof of the accusation and this particular example may vary among age groups because most older people are not much familiar with the term. These are examples of slang diction. Other examples include spilling the tea, which means telling the gossip. To be woke is to be aware of what's happening in the world, especially in terms of social issues. To YOLO is to live like it's your last day. YOLO actually means you only live once, so you try to live your life to the fullest. These are examples of slang diction because they are new, 
shortened, and modified and is well known by the younger audience. Of course, we Filipinos won't be left behind with the use of slang words. Lodi is an example of a modified word. It is pronounced backwards instead of idol, though it still means the same. Petmalu is also a modified word because the syllables were rearranged. It actually means it's awesome or cool. The latest is probably the outs gege. It means ouch, okay, or that hurts, okay. Jowa is a slang word that refers to a person's significant other. Mamshi doesn't necessarily refer to a mother of someone, but these days it is actually used to affectionately refer to a close friend. Another slang term that has been here long before is Sus Mariosep. It is a shortened word for Jesus Mary Joseph and is used as a sigh of frustration or surprise. Do not be confused between the two. Just remember that colloquial varies from different places or regions, while slang words are new words, shortened or modified, and may vary across age groups. Next is pedantic diction. It is used when writers highlight detailed or academic in their writing. For example, the weatherman said, The precipitation will accumulate high in the atmosphere, combining with jet streams moving in from the northeastern that has been hovering over the New England states. Erica asked her mom what that meant. Her mom said, He means it might rain tomorrow. Erica replied, Why didn't he just say so? The weatherman used pedantic diction because it highlights scientific terms and is very trivial-like. Look at this sentence. Paul, a professor, was on a guided tour at the Musée Rodin with his girlfriend. Several times throughout the tour, Paul interrupted the guide to interject his thoughts and opinions, causing his girlfriend to roll her eyes. There wasn't much pedantic diction because there wasn't a dialogue, but it still is considered a pedantic one because it still highlights the academic knowledge of the professor who keeps interacting the guide to add to the tour what he knows. Next, poetic diction. It uses words that relates to the theme of a poem and creates a harmonious sound. It involves use of descriptive language and figures of speech as well as rhymes and rhythm. Let's read this poem called Awakening in New York by Maya Angelou. Curtains forcing their will against the wind. Children asleep, exchanging dreams with seraphim. The city drags itself awake on subway straps. And I, unalarmed, awake as a rumor of war lies stretching into dawn, unasked and unheeded. This poem uses poetic diction because of the detailed description of what is happening to the persona in the poem. It uses descriptive language, one of the characteristics of a poem. Just by reading the poem, there is already a harmonious sound because of the words used. Descriptive and imaginative language are used in poetic diction. We have already discussed the six types of diction. Let's see more examples. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on. Notice the use of the formal ye instead of the informal you. The formality here is due to the respect the yearn inspires in Keats. In the same poem, he says, Ah, happy, happy vows, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. It is more formal to use adieu than to say goodbye. And the trees all died. They were orange trees. I don't know why they died, they just died. Something wrong with the soil possibly. Or maybe the stuff we got from the nursery wasn't the best. We complained about it. So we've got 30 kids there. Each kid had his or her own little tree to plant. And we've got these 30 dead trees. All these kids looking at these little brown sticks. It was depressing. The use of the words died, dead, brown sticks, and depressing gives a gloomy tone to the passage. This uses informal diction. So let's now discuss the purpose of diction. 
First, it creates a tone that supports your purpose. If your purpose is to let readers know what it feels like to be in a formal situation, then you will use formal diction. If you want to show what friends are like in normal setting or conversation, then you will use informal diction. Diction supports setting. Diction helps establish when and where stories took place by using language native to that time and place. If it's informal, we already get a hint that they may be friends or relatives. Colloquial diction lets us know which region or place they belong. Slang gives us a hint of what age group the characters are. Pedantic diction may be on an academic setting. Poetic diction may be in a place where lovers are. It establishes a narrative voice and tone. A writer's attitude towards the subject of a story comes through in the words they use. This helps on making an impact to the reader's emotional response. It brings characters to life. Writers can tell a lot about characters by what they say, what other people say about them, and how they think. A character's diction can also reflect details like age, gender, background, social setting, and profession. Good diction separates good writing from bad writing. Poor choice of words can lead to misinterpretation of the message intended to be conveyed. It is important that writers are able to use appropriate words in their story to make sure that the intended message of the work is conveyed to the readers. If you have questions, just ask your teachers and we are going to answer your queries. For tasks and activities, wait for your teacher's instructions. Well, that concludes our lesson and we hope you have learned from the video. Thank you and stay safe. Happy learning at home with lessons made easy by Olivarian Go Teach. One proud Olivarian.